your legislators is made possible by the Minnesota Corn Growers Association. From developing best practices that help farmers better protect our natural resource to the latest innovations in corn-based plastics, Minnesota corn farmers are proud to invest in third-party research leading to a more sustainable future for our local communities. Minnesota Farmers Union, standing for agriculture, working for farmers. On the web at MFU.org. Good evening and welcome to this week's version of Your Legislators, our inaugural program for the 2013 legis 2023 rather, legislative season. We're delighted that you are joining us this evening. I do want to remind you that this is the 43rd annual appearance of Your Legislators. We've had 43 seasons of this program with wonderful cooperation from our legislators throughout all that nearly half a decade who, who brought this program to you each week during the legislature legislative session. This is my uh, 33rd year as your genial host, and I'm delighted to be with you. I thought it would be interesting just to take a quick look at what leadership looked like at, um, at the commencement of this program. And just to take a couple of seconds through uh, history, and then we're going to talk a little bit about our, our current leadership. We're lucky to have uh, four members of that leadership, uh, team, those leadership teams here tonight. Election during the 1979-1981 um, legislative session, uh, the lineup in Minnesota for, for 67 uh, was uh, the majority leader DFLR Nick Coleman, minority leader Robert Ashbach, and in the Minnesota House of Representatives with 134 representatives. Just to show you that that divided legislation and closely legislation was evenly divided. And I won't go into the details of, of that, but we actually had speakers from both major political parties and majority leaders uh, uh, from both major political parties. Uh, the speaker, variously, was either Rod Searle or Fred Norton, Republican and Democrat, respectively. And the majority leader uh, was either Jerry Knickerbocker or Orv Anderson, respectively. And the minority leader, of course, was Rod Searle. I mention all of that because, as you've all been hearing, we've, we, uh, we have new leadership in the House and Senate, and I'm going to let our guests tonight talk about that leadership. But it is a diverse leadership, reflecting Minnesota's increasing diversity in the 43 years since that historic legislature met. Those were some famous and important names in the history of Minnesota, and I have little doubt that the leadership that I'll be introducing you to, to tonight and the others that serve with them in leadership will uh, equally fulfill those historic duties. I want to remind you, our viewers, that this is your program, and I would invite you to call in, follow the instructions on your screen with your questions for our panel. We've already had people who've, uh, who've figured out how to do that, and we're going to be able to start our panel. But let's begin this week as we do each week by introducing our distinguished panel of guests, and let's start with my old friend, uh, civic education friend, Senator Aaron Murphy, uh, Assistant Majority Leader from District 64 in St. Paul. Senator Murphy, tell our viewers a little bit about yourself and your enthusiasm for civics, too. So uh, the floor <laughs> is yours. Well, thank you so much. Uh, it is good to be with you tonight and uh, to be with this panel. Uh, I am delighted that we are uh, back to work and in session and off to a very robust start. I am, as you say, uh, 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 a strong believer in our democratic institutions, rooted in my deep belief in what we are able to accomplish together. And uh, we have shown up uh, after this election in both bodies, I believe, but certainly in the Senate where I'm serving with Senator Housley, uh, ready to get to work for the people of Minnesota, which is what I think Minnesotans want from us. Uh, so I'm, I'm delighted uh, to start my second term in the Senate, having served 12 years in the Minnesota House. As you know, I'm a registered nurse. I represent a district in St. Paul. I'm a mom, and I am really delighted to be here with you tonight. Well, we're, we're pleased to have you, Senator Murphy, and, and uh, 
um, we'll have opportunities to talk about the issues of the day as we move uh, through the calendar, through the items that our viewers are going to bring with us. Let's go to Senator Karen Housley, Assistant Minority Leader from District 33 Stillwater. We were just talking about the great city of Stillwater in Washington County and the opportunities that exist there. Um, I was commending Senator Housley. They, they do a great job sponsoring uh, uh, activities for Special Olympics events at that lovely uh, Civic Center that you have uh, next to the high school there. But tell, tell us a little bit about yourself, Senator Housley, uh, and uh, to our viewers. Thank you, Barry, and thank you for having me on. I don't know if you know this, but after 10 years of being in the Senate, this is the first time I have been on your legislators. So this is truly an honor, and it is about time. Um, Senator we'll, we'll speak to whoever's responsible for extending those invitations, and <laughs> we'll, we'll, uh, we will we will we uh, will uh, issue uh, the appropriate yeah. punishment for failing to invite you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, Senator Karen Housley. I do represent Senate District Thirty Three, which is Stillwater. Forest Lake, Hugo, and the surrounding communities. It is probably the best district in the state, but I know they're all going to say that same thing, but it is really God's country out here. Um, I'm now serving my fourth term in the Senate. Um, I'm a small business owner. I started Housley Homes in 2002, and now my daughters are in the business with me. They pretty much run it, and I work for them now because I'm busy doing this other job with, with these legislators that down at the Capitol. Um, truly, truly enjoy what we do and um, ready to get to work for the people of Minnesota in our district. So thank you again, Barry, for having me. And we're delighted to have you as part of the panel this evening, even if it is your first time. So uh, <laughs> also joining us uh, is Representative Jamie Long, who um, uh, represents uh, District 61B in Minneapolis and is the Majority Leader of the caucus. Uh, a little bit about yourself. Sure. Hi, Barry. Well, thanks so much for the invitation to be with you and be with all these fine colleagues. Uh, I'm Jamie Long. I, as you mentioned, represent Minneapolis. I'm excited to be the newly elected majority leader in the House. And uh, I used to chair the Climate and Energy Committee last session. That's part of my background and passion is uh, clean energy. Um, it's what I have did professionally for, for many years. And uh, I have two small kids um, and um, excited to be Back to work, as Aaron said, we've had a, I think, great first couple of weeks and looking forward to the discussion tonight. Um, thanks, Representative. Delighted to have you here. And then finally, Representative Jim Nash from uh, District uh, f uh, 48 in Waconia. I can't read my handwriting here. Uh, Minority Whip. <laughs> Representative Nash, tell our viewers a little bit about yourself. Well, good evening, Barry. Thanks for having me on. I think this is my fourth time on the show. And I'm grateful that I get to be the leadoff hitter again for se this season. Uh, you had me on last time as well. Uh, so I, this is my fifth term in the House, and it's gone fast. I actually served with Representative then Representative Murphy, now Senator Murphy, uh, for one term. Uh, when we, we met here in the state office building for uh, a horrible, hot locker room feeling special session, um, but I, I love serving here in the House. I've, I've had the good fortune of representing the folks of, of now central Carver County and uh, have done that for the last 10, oh, coming up on 10 years. Um, before that, I was the mayor there in Waconia. One of my passion committees is the one that almost everybody rolls their eyes at. I love state government finance committee because it's where every nickel effectively comes through and it, it covers a very broad breadth of things. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of my other passions is cybersecurity and IT, and we've had the good fortune of, of working together with many of my DFL colleagues and uh, really propelling uh, what's called Minute or Minnesota IT forward in the last number of years to where it is actually now a very uh, high functioning, respectable IT organization. And previously it used to be the thing that made us all roll our eyes and spit on the ground because it was, it was not working particularly well. So. I, I appreciate the opportunity to be here with my colleagues and uh, and talk about what's important to Minnesotans. So uh, it is will come as no surprise to veterans on our panel uh, that one of the very first questions we get from uh, a viewer um, is uh, what what I would call uh, one of our um, regular participants, uh, and this is a question we get um, almost every week. We might as well start right out with it. A viewer from Morris wants to know, will recreational cannabis be legalized this session? Senator Murphy, let's start with you. Uh, it's a great question, and I believe the answer is yes. Um, I, I think Minnesotans have expressed in 
in many ways, whether it is an end to prohibition uh, or their, their pursuit of a more just Minnesota or their interest in regulating something to make it safer, they have suggested their support. Uh, and there's been a great deal of work that I haven't really been a part of, but particularly led in the Minnesota House, where there have been intentional debates, conversations, town hall meetings with Minnesotans across the state, preparing and engaging on this topic. And at least in my experience across the state in the last number of years, this is an issue that comes up over and over and over again. And change. And, and, and if you come back to us like on this, our program later this week, later this year, it, we'll probably get the question again. So it's not just yep. the, not no, just yes. your visit. I think it will. I do. Yes. I think it will. And I think it's time. Uh, Senator Housley, your thoughts. Um, funny story, and I don't think I've ever shared this story before. In 1982, um, I graduated from South St. Paul High School, and my boyfriend at the time, who is now my husband, Phil, we had to write a research paper, and he was off playing hockey in some other country. And when he came back, the teacher said he had to get his paper done in three days. So he asked me to help him write his paper, and I said, sure, what do you want to write the paper on? And he said, why we should legalize marijuana in the state of Minnesota. And this was in 1982, to which I was totally opposed to it, but I helped him write his paper. He ended up getting an A on his paper and I only got a B on my paper. But <laughs> now here we are 40 years later and we're still talking about it. Um, I, I have always been opposed to it. Still, we have the argument within my own family um, because of different concerns. But I just wanna make sure that, I mean, it's not up to us whether it gets passed or not because they're in complete control. I just hope that that the bill does get um, properly vetted because there are concerns. I just came from my Washington County Commissioner's meeting and we have the Washington County Sheriff there and he had some some concerns about, you know, testing those under the influence. Like, where are the where are the parameters to that? So I just want to make sure that the bill is properly vetted and it's something that will keep Minnesotans safe when it does come out of committee. Representative Long, your thoughts? Well, uh, to the gentleman from Morris, uh, yes, we will legalize cannabis this year for adult use. And we did pass the bill uh, in the House last session. It was a bipartisan vote and we are going to pass it again. And we're going to do so thoughtfully and we're going to do so carefully. As uh, Senator Murphy mentioned, my predecessor in the majority leader role, uh, Representative Weekler, spent uh, weeks of his life traveling the state, doing listening sessions and Minnesotans want this. Uh, it's not universal, but if you look at public support over time, it has drastically moved towards getting rid of prohibition, and that's because it hasn't worked. And we know it hasn't worked for many reasons. One is that uh, we have a, an illegal market that uh, has criminalized uh, disproportionately people of color. In my city of Minneapolis, the usage rates are basically identical between white people and black people but the arrest rates are seven times for black people what they are for white people. And so we've, uh, it's been legal essentially if you're white in Minnesota to use cannabis for a long time. Uh, but if you're a person of color, it has not been and that has caught up people in our system uh, that has had really significant consequences on their ability to find jobs, their ability to get housing, their ability to lead lives. And so it's a time that we do this uh, and we have to do it thoughtfully. We have to make sure that we're protecting youth. We have a 21 year age uh, requirement, uh, similar to how we have for alcohol. We have requirements on where to sell. We have requirements on licensing. Uh, we have a very thoughtfully put together bill. It's over 200 pages, but it can be improved. And I think it will be improved. And I, I think it will be improved in a bipartisan way uh, with input from, from all sides as we're moving forward. Representative Nash, your thoughts? Uh, thank you, Barry. I, I, yes, the bill will be passed. And as Senator Housley said, it, it will be done. Uh, I'm not going to be voting for it. And I, I have some concerns, I think, that are legitimate concerns. I think that the, the iteration of the bill that we saw last time had some things that I, I did not necessarily think were, were serious pieces of legislation. Um, it took away some of the local control that cities uh, that might wish to opt out of having a dispensary located in their, their city confines were disallowed from doing that. Uh, I think that there was another thing that I, I think Representative Winkler may have consulted the Department of Caprice and Whimsy when he put into the bill that uh, it had to be delivered by an electronic or electric vehicle. Uh, I, I think that was 
a tip of the hat to uh, Tesla drivers or, or folks like that. But my biggest concern is one that is, has been echoed to me by a number of my constituents, uh, both who are in favor and that are opposed. And, and it's namely, how do you test roadside uh, to find out someone's level of impairment? And I, I think this is a really important thing that I, I would have hoped that all members, all 201 members of the legislature would say is something that really has to be thoughtfully crafted because we are creating policy that's going to last for uh, a, a fairly long time. And if we if we purposely miss something that we shouldn't have, I, I think that's shame on us. I certainly understand that the, the DFL is going to uh, pass this, but I hope that they've listened to some of the pushback that uh, some of us have offered. And I, I think that the roadside testing and giving cities and municipalities and counties the ability to exercise local control is certainly a very important aspect of whatever the final bill is going to be. I hope those things are in it, and I hope that the testing has been resolved. All right, very good. We have a question from a viewer in Brainerd who wants to talk about school finance. And this viewer is concerned about um, sort of what I would call macro questions, which is uh, how is the legislature planning to address school uh, financing, school funding? And I suppose that leads naturally into a school funding issue. We can, you can take it at a macro level and also general level. Let's start with you, Senator Housley. School funding issues, where does that go this session? What's your view? Um, well, there's enough money there now for, um, they've been talking about how they want to fully fund education for years and years and years. There's enough money there to like overfund education. So what does fully funding mean? So that's, that's something that, that um, will be before the, the legislature and we're gonna have to look at all of those. I know in my district, transportation um, inequality from Forest Lake, what they get per pupil compared to what they get in other cities in my district is because of the distance that the bus has to go. I've been trying to get funding for that forever. So hopefully let's, hopefully Aaron, you're listening. Um, <laughs> That, that's something um, that's very important to, uh, and even that uh, caller that just um, called in from Brainerd um, with that question, it's very important to that district too. So I, I am not sure where the Democrats are gonna go with fully funding, what that looks like from, from their side. We're just gonna be uh, passengers and um, again, making sure that whatever it is that it gets um, full bipartisan support. Senator Murphy, your thoughts. Uh, <clears throat> one of our fundamental responsibilities is to prepare the next generations uh, to live and lead uh, the lives that they're choosing here in the state of Minnesota. Uh, we all have an interest in that and our public schools are fundamental to that. Uh, I think that we need to make sure that the funding that goes into our public schools uh, yields that result. It should be transparent, it should be effective, uh, and it should be targeted in such a way that we are you know, achieving the outcome that we want for every kid, wherever they live here in the state of Minnesota. Uh, we do have a, a really remarkable opportunity right now. As we did a decade ago, uh, when we had a trifecta the last time, and there was a real effort led by then Representative Paul Marquardt to invest in world-class schools and world-class education. We've been through a lot in the last decade, uh, particularly when I think about COVID. And I wanna make sure that the kids that are coming through our schools right now have every opportunity. And so yes, this will be a priority for our caucus. I think it'll be a priority for the Senate and I am listening, Senator Housley. And while I understand, right, I have been in the minority and I've been in the majority, but please know how much I wanna work with you to make sure that we're doing right by our kids wherever they live here in the state of Minnesota. And if we do that, if we keep them at the center of the discussion, uh, we're gonna do right by them and that's gonna be good for our future. Thanks. Senator. Representative Thank Nash, you. school funding. Yeah, so the Senator, Senator Housley sort of alluded to the, the notion of the word that we call down here, equalization. I think that as a, as a father of six kids who have gone through the Waconia Public School District, um, the money that we get based on the formula that is applied uh, to the education funding is it nets out to be much different than it does in some of the, the downtown schools. And I think that we should have a, a, a very frank conversation about that because it is, 
an uneven playing field for funding of the schools in my neck of Minnesota. And, uh, you know, I, I will I will hold the governor to his promise to once again talk about a one Minnesota so that the kids in District 110 or District 112, Eastern Carver, parts of Norwood, Watertown Mayor, all have the ability to uh, know that the money that's coming to them from the formula that we that we use is going to be equalized. Um, again, I'm a big proponent of public school. I myself attended public school. Some might say I turned out okay. Others might argue differently. Um, but I think that that I, I love the story that my kids get to share that that they invested in their community. And I think that we as legislators, uh, when we say, what does it mean to, to fully fund education? We have to talk about the equalization part of this. And to not, I think is ignoring something that has been glaring at us for a long time. It preceded my time here. It probably preceded uh, both of the senators' times here. And, and if we're gonna talk about it, let's fix it before we just put it in a drawer and keep moving. Representative Long, your thoughts? Well, thanks. I, I think that the Senate uh, Democrats, the House Democrats and the governor are all unified that this is going to be a top priority. And I think that you've heard from all of us that we're going to uh, push hard to make sure that our schools are given the resources they need to make sure that all of our kids are educated and all of our kids have an excellent education. And we uh, had a press conference uh, the first week of session where the House and the Senate rolled out shared priorities. It doesn't happen very often, uh, and we had unified priorities, and K-12 education was high on the list, um, one of the very top priorities that we have to make sure that we are doing everything we can for our schools. And we've seen education funding has uh, declined as a state, as a percentage of our overall budget in real terms for our school districts. We saw big cuts under Governor Pawlenty, and we've never gotten back to where we were. Uh, we have not kept pace with inflation. The increases that we've had over the past few years have been lower than the rate of inflation. So our school districts are losing ground uh, compared to the budgets that they've had in the past. And we prided ourselves in Minnesota on having excellent schools. We're slipping as a state in terms of where we are overall. And we've never had excellent schools for everybody. We've had big disparities in our state in terms of educational opportunity and educational outcomes based on race. Uh, and we have a real responsibility to step up and make sure that we're helping every kid in this state. And we uh, are some of the proposals that we have to do that. One is to try to close some of the what we call cross subsidies, the uh, amounts that we're requiring school districts to pay that we're not. We're, uh, these are essentially unfunded mandates in uh, the terms of some of my Republican colleagues. We are giving school districts requirements and we are not uh, paying for those. So those include Special education, very important. We want all of our kids to receive education regardless of ability uh, and need. And we have uh, English language learner requirements as well to help uh, those who are learning English. And we don't pay for those services. And so we need to close that. We need to fully fund uh, both of those services. And I do think that we're going to take a hard look at our uh, formula funding, the funding that we uh, send to every school district uh, in the state as well. And I think we're going to take a hard look at uh, indexing that to inflation so that we don't have to come back year after year after year and pretend that if we're giving schools uh, the rate of inflation, that that's an actual increase because it's not. If a school district is paying 5% more in a year, the next year for uh, all of the textbooks and paper and pencils that they need, uh, then that isn't uh, an increase in their budget. That's holding their budget flat. So we need to do honest budgeting and honest accounting and help our schools succeed. Uh, anyone else want to jump in on school funding before we move on to the next topic? Uh, if if not, I could just we'll add a quick. If you are from Madison, <clears throat> excuse me, Madison, Minnesota, not uh, Madison, Wisconsin. Madison, Wisconsin is <laughs> entitled to call in too. We're happy to talk to them. <laughs> Problems, particularly greater Minnesota. This uh, viewer is concerned about regulations that uh, are uh, placed on daycare providers. Uh, and uh, the viewer is convinced. The viewer is asking the legislators about the the issue that uh, regulations actually make it difficult uh, to get uh, uh, daycare services into Greater Minnesota. So let's start. <clears throat> I'm sure that issue is more than just uh, affecting more than just uh, um, 
Westboro, Minnesota. Let's start with you, Representative Long. Um, daycare providers, uh, what, what can you help us? With? What can you tell us about that issue? Sure. Well, I'm, I'm taking daycare to mean uh, child care, early childhood. Right. Um, so the I have two small kids uh, and I know the child care system well. And I think this is a concern that uh, those in urban Minnesota, those in suburban Minnesota, those in greater Minnesota all share, which is affordability and availability of high quality child care. Uh, I've heard that from my colleagues all over the state, and it's certainly going to be a high priority for us. Uh, in Minnesota, we have some of the highest average child care costs of any state. Um, and right now, the average child care cost for pre-K is the same as first year tuition at the University of Minnesota. Uh, and we're asking families to pay that at a time when they're earlier in their earning potential, when they are just getting started rather than, uh, you know, college where you're encouraged to save for 18 years, right? So that's been a huge impact on our workforce, on our ability for people to get back into work. Um, a lot of individuals cite that as the number one reason why they're still home, why we don't have a higher workforce participation rate. So this is a huge problem and really needs uh, big solutions. And uh, it's something that we're going to take very seriously. One thing is that the business model for childcare is really broken. We don't pay uh, providers enough. We don't pay uh, the teachers, the individuals who are in early childhood classrooms enough. And it's very hard to make that work. So we propose in one of our early priorities, moving the reimbursement rates up uh, for providers to make sure that they are getting uh, more help in uh, getting uh, uh, better reimbursement uh, to be able to uh, have more opportunities. We also are going to be looking at uh, many of the models that are out there for providing early childhood, trying to provide support for scholarships, for um, learning in school, school settings. There's a lot of different opportunities we have, uh, but we know that we need to tackle this and we need to approach it early. In terms of the um, question on regulation, uh, it's certainly something I've heard about from from some child care providers. We do want to make sure that our, our child care uh, is safe and we want to make sure that it's high quality. Uh, you know, I'm certainly open to suggestions on, on specific changes that could be made in our child care setting. Uh, but I think the finance is the biggest problem uh, for our for our early childhood settings. And we just don't have a sustainable funding model and putting it on the backs of uh, parents is not working. Representative Nash. Your thoughts? Uh, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Barry. I, I would say that the question is based uh, is asked on regulations and, and coming from the private sector, regulations will eventually drive up the cost of things that are getting passed on to the people who are uh, consuming the product, whether it's daycare or something else. And I think we have to look very long and hard at the, the requirements that we're placing on people who are the providers of this very valuable service and and ask are we regulating people out of the ability to afford the service that we claim that they need the most um you know I, our family was very fortunate to uh, my wife stayed home for a, a good portion of our six kids child rearing days that's not always possible for everybody and i certainly understand that but when we we look fundamentally at what is what are the cost inputs thinking as uh, you know, from an economic perspective, if you look at the inputs that are going into the service that's being created, uh, regulation drives compliance. Compliance has to have a lot of other things that go along with it. And it does drive up the cost. So if we're going to have an honest conversation to the, the questioner's uh, initial question, we have to look at what is regulation doing to the, the cost that is uh, really shutting a lot of people out of the market. I don't necessarily agree that the government has to write another check to cover this, I think that we have to look at what has the government done to drive the cost up. Do you? Um, I know this question has been around uh, some. Um, we've had we've had it in previous programs, and I'm wondering uh, if you've had uh, any experience with this. Have, have uh, people specifically identified regulations that are concerning? Uh, I, I can tell you that from my old days as a city attorney, I had some issues with the Department of. Uh, Department of Health with regard to hospital regulations about where, you know, um, railings go and things like that. But I'm just wondering in the daycare setting, if uh, do you have any do you have any thoughts on specific issues that have come up in your conversations with people about these issues? Yeah, and, and if, I wish that I would have known the question was coming because I, I do have some notes. Right, it's home. not. I, I, and 
And I, I had told you earlier that I, I don't feel like I can do video from home because my cats, Moose and Mowgli, decide to jump in front of the computer and they blow the entire interview up. But I, 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 I think that it's worth all of us to sit down and have a conversation and, and recognize that uh, varying types of regulation do drive costs. And let's talk about, let's measure them. Let's measure the, the things that we're requiring providers to do. And maybe every now and then we'll, we'll be able to have the frank conversation amongst ourselves that maybe this regulation uh, isn't having the desired impact and we, we back it off. So. Terry, you Osley, uh, your thoughts. Well, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Representative Long. Do you have something to add to that? I'll be, I'll be real brief. One of the things that folks have sometimes raised to me who brought up this question is uh, we have ratios of the number of early childhood uh, teachers that need to be in a specific classroom with kids. And so it's been raised, well, that adds cost, And it certainly does, but it's also there for good reason, which is that you want to make sure you have a safe classroom where you have the ability to, you know, take care of the infants who are in that room, take care of the young kids. Uh, so the, the regulations that we have in place aren't there for no reason. Uh, they're there for important reasons. And so certainly open to the discussion. But uh, I think we have to realize that uh, we have some of our most valuable young people in the state in these settings, and, and we need to be thoughtful about how we're protecting them, too. That's your thoughts. Daycare regulations, daycare costs, et cetera. Um, yeah, I had the privilege of being the chair of the um, Long-Term Care and Aging and Family Care Committee. And so we did a lot of work with the child care, both the centers and the in-home daycare uh, providers. Um, and, and being able to listen to all of them uh, and what their concerns are. And regulations is a big deal, especially if you're in greater Minnesota. A lot of them have now just closed up shop. This was even before COVID and now after COVID, it's, it's, there's even that much fewer. And that's the number one issue is from coming from our Chamber of Commerce is they need workers, but people can't go to work if they don't have daycare. So uh, doing what we can for our, and especially in, in greater Minnesota, uh, there is such, such a need for more daycare providers. Uh, and regulations is what is what caused a lot of them to quit. Um, I, and I don't remember the specifics like you were talking, Representative Nash, um, but when it comes to um, uh, the county inspector coming to the in-home daycare provider and um, issuing them a bunch of violations, when instead, could you just give them some warnings and allow them to fix it immediately? So they, they feel this huge weight all the time when they're gonna get this surprise visit and they're not huge violations, just educate them on the spot, get them to fix it. If it's not that much of a, a safety hazard, if it's not a safety hazard, um, just get them to fix it on the spot. I do know, and this does worry me, back when um, the Democrats had uh, both the House and the Senate and the, um, Governor uh, Dayton at the time, um, they were trying to force, um, the Democrats had a bill to require all of our in-home family daycare providers to unionize. Um, that was, we, on the Senate floor, maybe you remember it, Barry, it was, it when it's, it's a record for the Senate. We debated that all night long to really stick up for our, in home daycare providers. So just just in whatever in whatever bills come before us, I do hope that they have all stakeholders at the table and again getting bipartisan support and listening to everybody before anything does cross that finish line is what I'm hoping for. Senator Murphy, we finally get to you. Let's talk a little bit about daycare uh, issues, uh, daycare regulation, supporting daycare providers. The floor is yours. Thank you, Barry. Uh, I I think if if you've been doing this for 33 years, I bet many of those 33 years you've been talking about child care. This, this is, is not, not the first time we've had the question. I would agree. That's right. Uh, and I think we've we've admired the problem for a long time. Um, I, I have been among those who have uh, looked at the issue of regulation. And, you know, I chose the profession of nursing, um, not because I wanted to do paperwork, but because I wanted to take care of people. Um, and yet the documentation that is a part of nursing is really important to make sure that we're meeting standards, et cetera. So there is a role for regulation. I, I'm with everybody else in this group. If we can take a look at that and ease that burden and maintain high quality 
and safety, I'm all for it. But I don't think that is the fundamental problem. And I was also in the legislature uh, when we took this up, this issue up a decade ago, and we didn't pass a bill to require unionization. We passed a bill that would allow child care workers to organize and, and unionize if they chose to, which they rejected. Um, Senator Housley and I worked together last year with a group of frontline workers, including child care providers, who did incredible work during the course of the pandemic. And one of the things that sticks with me uh, after these last couple of years is the fact that it is home care workers and nursing home workers and child care workers, the people who are caring for our loved ones, that make such low wages that we can't keep the workforce in place. Um, and that's a real problem for communities all across the state, and it impacts the workforce, it impacts employers, it impacts our ability to work and support our families and our livelihoods. So it is, it's a real issue. Obviously, we all know that. And I do think a sustainable funding mechanism is the answer to this question. If we want to make sure that people who are doing this work are highly prepared, they're well trained, and they're well compensated. We will have an opportunity to discuss this issue again in the weeks ahead. Let's move on to another question. This one from one of our regular viewers in Duluth who wants to know what um, steps the legislature might be taking in this session to deal with the uh, fentanyl slash opioid, but particularly fentanyl crisis. Uh, and um, I think we're up to you, Senator Murphy. I th think you're, it's your turn to uh, lead us off. Uh, so talk about that issue for a moment, if you would, please. So, you know, we're coming through a period of time where there has been a fair amount of work done on the issue of opioids with the settlement. Uh, and money, uh, hopefully come into communities that are going to support treatment. And really the answer to this question uh, is, from my perspective, adequate treatment. Uh, fentanyl is the, the newest iteration of uh, uh, a drug that is being, you know, compounded into other things. And it is, it is a serious, serious narcotic with significant ramifications. So, of course, we need to think about uh, how it's coming to us. Uh, but uh, whether it is the opioid crisis that we've experienced or fentanyl um, or the other myriad uh, number of substances that people are using, uh, the real root of the problem is substance abuse and adequate treatment for people who are using. Representative uh, Nash, your thoughts, fentanyl. I, I think that you're going to hear all four of us give some very similar variations on a theme. You know, we often hear that you put two Democrats and two Republicans in the room and all we'll do is probably fight. Uh, that's not always the case. It just, doesn't, it just doesn't make TV because it's not good TV. They want to see us go <laughs> after each other. Mm -hmm. But I, I have learned a lot since I got here from my dear friend, Representative Dave Baker, uh, who lost a son to this. And I think as a, as a dad, my kids have not gone down the road that, that led his son, Dan, to where that happened. But what a tragic thing. And if we can come together and recognize that it's not all one particular viewpoint perspective, that it's, an, it's kind of an all of the above. How do we fix this? I think that that's going to be a, a, an infinitely better. Is it, is it more education? Is it possibly more funding? Is it... Um, pushing the discussion earlier in the education system? Is it making sure that we're doing a better job of substance abuse? Yes, because we owe it to the precious people that we bring into this planet and, and uh, to, to make sure that they're educated well. And, you know, uh, Senator Murphy, my mom, was a nurse as well. And uh, she, like you, probably fought like crazy to keep people alive. And uh, when, when you lose somebody, it's painful. And she's recounted a number of things to me that, that happened like that, whether it was a, you know, a heart attack or, or drug abuse. We can do better. Um, I think that some of us just have to maybe put um, our, our inclination to bristle against the other side down for a little bit and say, you know, how can we work together and then go do it? Because I, I, I again, have learned so much from Representative Baker, and I know that he's meant so much to a lot of people around the Capitol in telling his story because it's compelling. Um, 
So let's do that. Let's do those things. Let's work together and roll up our sleeves uh, and stop, stop it. Well, Senator Murphy, you've encouraged me a number of times to stop calling you Senator and call you by your first name. Let's let's Please. get to the point where we, we say, hey, Aaron, Jim, how can we roll up our sleeves and do something important together and don't look at the DFL and the GOP uh, Just say, hey, Minnesotans are watching and they need a solution. Representative Long, your thoughts? Well, I agree with uh, Jim. We're going to find a lot of agreement on this topic. Um, I have family members addicted to opioids. It, it ruins lives. It, it is a really harmful uh, and terrible addiction. And I do, one thing I'll just add is that I, I think uh, Governor Wallace deserves a lot of credit for taking this issue very seriously. And he uh, has created a sub cabinet. He's created a new director to work on addiction uh, and recovery. Uh, that's a position that just started last year. And so uh, I know that the administration is working really hard to try to coordinate response um, and look at solutions uh, to help with treatment, to help with recovery. So I, I think uh, all of us in the House, the Senate, the governor are taking this issue seriously, are trying to look at options where we can help get people treatment, help get people on a pathway to recovery and uh, try to deal with some of these drugs like fentanyl that are highly destructive and highly addictive. Senator Housley. Thank you, Barry. Um, and I, I want to um, echo what Representative Nash said. It, we actually do get a lot of good work done, Democrats and Republicans together. And, and I know Senator Murphy, Aaron, and I have, have done a lot together, but you don't see it on the front page or see it on the, on the TV news because um, it, it's not sensational. It's really, really good work, but it's, it's just not the, not the sexy topics that people, it draws people to, uh, to the television. But on this one, um, I have four kids and I was so thankful that got them all through high school and college and, and they lived. Um, and I thought, okay, I'm, I'm over that. I'm over the whole drug thing. I can, I'm good now. No, now I have grandkids in elementary school. And when they're making fentanyl look like candy, I'm telling you, Halloween, I went through their whole bag. I'm, I'm so, so, so nervous. Um, like Senator Murphy said, um, treatment and education, we really, really need to be um, getting funding for both treatment and education. And also um, how, that, how those drugs are getting here um, illegally, uh, we, we have to put those criminals in jail. We've got to catch them, prosecute them, and get them off the streets and get these drugs off the streets. So any, any funding that we can put there to, towards our law enforcement <coughs> to get these criminals off the street would be helpful. I don't normally um, get involved in the substance of our exchanges, but I can't resist the opportunity to just note briefly, and it will be brief, that the contribution of the judicial branch to this over the course, uh, now my 20, some almost 20 years on the Supreme Court, uh, is um, the use of drug courts, which have been, um, you know, like, like other institutions, they're not perfect, but there are some remarkable stories that come out of those experiences. Um, for me, one of them was watching a, I won't say which legislator, but watching a legislator um, uh, appear to um, uh, thank the drug court personnel, uh, noting that he had had a family member many years ago um, who largely had his life ruined as a result of drugs, and he'd seen lives saved as a result of the, the drug court opportunities. So. Um, that's maybe an encouraging note on a very difficult subject, and uh, um, there will be more to say about that as we move forward. Now, we have a viewer from Minneapolis who wants to talk about public housing and mm -hmm. housing costs. This viewer specifically asks when the state is going to get involved in fixing up public housing, um, but I think the question is probably, we, we should try to answer that viewer's question, but I think it's more broad than just that. There are housing issues generally. Let's start with you, Representative Nash. Um, housing questions, public housing. Um, what, yeah. What's your view on where that might go this session? Thank you, and, and this is the question I, I was hoping somebody would ask. I, I have well, there many, you go. Years. It's, uh, yeah. We aim to please. It's my dream come true. So for yes. many, many years here at the Capitol, I have worked on on the notion of housing affordability. And uh, I, I now serve on uh, the 
the Commission for Housing Affordability, Senator Housley's there, and this year and last year I was uh, I'm co-chair with Senator Dizik. I hope she's able to find the time to stick with it because I know she's passionate about this. Here's the thing. The six kids that I've mentioned, uh, they may or may not be able to afford a home in the state of Minnesota when they choose to come back, if they choose to come back. And my wife and I are certainly hoping that not right now, but one day there will be grandkids. Um, take your time, kids. Uh, but <laughs> we have a housing crisis on multiple levels. We, it, it is in how are we, how quickly are we building or in what quantity are we building starter homes? But it's also in how are we providing affordable housing for people who uh, want to live or need to live in an apartment to have that secure housing for themselves. Um, I say this regularly, a stable home builds stable communities, stable families, increases the opportunity for children to succeed educationally and as people. Housing is fundamental to the success of our future. Uh, it comes in a lot of different formats and Representative Long may or may not roll his eyes when I bring, break out my tried and true equation uh, analogy. I made it through algebra and I, I actually kind of liked it, but if you remember quadratic equations, there's a lot of stuff above the line, there's a lot of stuff below the line, and you have to solve each piece. Those integers above the line, some of them are apartments, some of them are um, income, low income housing, workforce housing, um, starter homes, and how do you move people progressionally through each of those stops along the way? I think as it relates to the question of your, of your caller though, um, I'm very concerned uh, talking to some of the people that I have talked to in the housing provider industry that the, what is going to happen as a result of, of potential statewide rent control, I believe there's a bill out there for that, but certainly in, in St. Paul, there has been rent control. And go back to the, the question we just talked about. If you elevate one form of a cost or another, it's going to have a, a, a dramatic impact. But we have people who need housing and they need it now. I know we have a large number of homeless and that breaks all four of the hearts of the legislators here. And yes, folks watching legislators have hearts. Um, but we have to fix this. And it's not, it's not simply fixing one end of the spectrum. It's, it's solving each part of that equation. And it is apartments. It is uh, twin homes. It is in zoning. It is in inspection fees. It is in a number of things. Uh, and we can't just simply say, oh, I, I fixed the, uh, the, the number of apartments in pick a city and then dust off your hands and say, oh, I got it solved. It's not that easy. It's very, very difficult, and I hope once again that we can, uh, as legislators in both parties, in both chambers, roll up our sleeves and, and figure it out because it, uh, it's, it's vital. Senator Murphy, your thoughts, housing issues. Uh, so, crisis is right on many levels. Uh, it will take some money, uh, which we have. Uh, one of the things I've been thinking a lot about in the, this morning in our finance committee, we had the debate about whether or not to include, again, inflation in the state's budgeting forecast, which I think is an important measure. It, it's eliminating a gimmick that's been in the budget for far too long. Uh, but we know that we have a surplus. It's a lot of one-time money. One-time money can build a lot of housing. Um, so I think that that should and will be a, a real priority. Uh, for the people of Minnesota and for this legislature, both sides of the aisle. Uh, Representative Nash, I love what you have to say about that. Uh, I had a conversation with my colleague, uh, Senator Port, uh, just yesterday. She is the chair of the Housing Committee uh, in the Minnesota Senate, and she is focusing on uh, kids, uh, which I think is right. You know, we've done a lot of good work to make sure that veterans are no longer experiencing homelessness, and we've made real progress there. I like that she's thinking about kids, uh, especially in the relationship to pe young people and their education and their well-being. Um, but I, I, I understand and appreciate that this is a statewide problem and we do need creative and multiple level solutions in order to solve it. Representative Long, your thoughts? Sure, well, I, I agree with a lot of what's been said, but uh, 
what I'll add is I do think this will be a bipartisan priority this year. Um, and I, I uh, have good uh, reason to believe that because Leader Damoth, when asked our very first press conference what two areas we might be able to work together on uh, with Republicans and Democrats, said early childhood, which we've already talked about, and housing. So I think that this will be an area where there's a lot of interest in working together. We know there's affordable housing issues all across the state, uh, and this doesn't affect anyone, just one community. And I also agree that there are many, many avenues that we need to uh, pursue and uh, many types of affordable housing that we need to develop. To respond to the questioners asked specifically about public housing needs, we have a huge backlog in public housing maintenance. Um, and we really do need to help uh, our public housing providers in improving the quality of housing and get, dealing with some of the unsafe conditions that we know exist in our public housing in the state. We also need to make sure that we have more affordable rent. And right now in Minnesota, 500,000 Minnesotans in every given month are at risk of losing their housing because their rent is unaffordable. And the definition there is you're paying more than 30% of your income and rent, which is just crazy uh, to think about a family trying to get by with one third of their income uh, going to their housing. And so we have half a million people every single day uh, who are in that situation and struggling. So there's been a proposal that uh, was in our top bill introductions in both the House and Senate called Bring It Home, which would help individuals uh, with some rental assistance. There's a federal rental assistance program right now that is woefully inadequate. It has 15 to 20 year waiting lines uh, for individuals to get rental assistance. So having a state program would go a really long way. Uh, in addition to building new affordable housing, we could help people get into housing that is available at a rate that they could afford. Senator Housley. Thank you, Barry. Look at how well we get along, see? Uh, same priorities. Um, I sat on the, the housing committee um, the last uh, session, and I am on Senator Port's housing and homeless committee this session, and we actually are doing a housing tour tomorrow. Um, I agree with everybody. We're actually one of the worst states in the country when it comes to affordable housing. And being on the other side of it in real estate for the last 20 some years, um, you can get a starter home in the, in the surrounding states to Minnesota for a lot less than you can here in Minnesota. So it's, it breaks my heart when I have to bring somebody over to Hudson, Wisconsin, so they can buy their first home there because they can't afford it here. Like it can be ten to $20,000 more, but that's actually the difference in, in getting their 30-year mortgage and able, being able to make that payment. And we toured a lot in the last um, session uh, to the developers and what the what the causes were, why it was so much more expensive here. And it does, a lot of it does come down to regulations. And I hope that is something that can get addressed because it is, we are in a crisis. There's so many crises that we're in, but this is our long-term caregivers, our child care, our schools and, and housing. Um, there's so many, but this, this, like we've all said, it is a priority for us and we do have to do something to make it better for everybody in Minnesota. Uh, we have just a minute and a half or so left. Just very quickly, um, we considered a bonding year. A uh, bonding bill did not pass in the last session. Um, will we have a bonding bill this year? Senator Murphy, very quickly. Yes. Anything in particular <laughs> you'd like to see in that bill? I'll give you one few seconds to talk about that. Oh, well, I think it's got to have, uh, you know, statewide infrastructure uh, projects. I, I mean, there's such a long list and a backlog. There are projects in the in the district I represent and in St. Paul, but, you know, I've got an eye on the full state and there's plenty of work to do. So let's let's get it done. Representative Long, your thoughts. Bonding bill this session? I think we'll do several. Uh, I think <laughs> we'll have at least two. And uh, we have a bonding bill that's in pretty good shape that was left over from last session and never never got done. And so I think we have a good starting point there, but we have new members and uh, new needs. So I think we have a, a big opportunity to, to get some projects done. Representative Nash, very quickly. I do think there will be one. My hope is that it is uh, chocked full of things that are made from concrete and rebar and employ Minnesotans and do crazy things like wastewater treatment plants and there's a levy in my district that is uh, is in trouble and water towers and things that 
enable growth for the people who live in Minnesota. Senator Housley, very quickly, bonding bill. Yep, I'm the Republican lead on the bonding committee. There will be a bonding bill, possibly two. Um, and yeah, a lot of infrastructure. And I'm happy that Senator Pappas has said it will be equal from um, greater Minnesota to um, the city. So yes. Very good. I want to thank our panel this evening for our, our inaugural 2023 show. Got the year right this time. I want to thank you for joining us this evening. It's been a great exchange of uh, views on the uh, issues that face the people of the state of Minnesota. Uh, I want to thank you, the viewers, for joining us. I want to remind you that you can watch the live coverage of the Minnesota Legislature every weekday evening uh, during the legislative session on the Minnesota Channel. We recommend you check it out, check your local listings, uh, and of course, we're also available on YouTube and at the Pioneer Public Television website. Thank you and good night. We look forward to seeing you next week and all the weeks that follow until the legislature goes home. Your Legislators is made possible by the Minnesota Corn Growers Association. From developing best practices that help farmers better protect our natural resources to the latest innovations in corn-based plastics, Minnesota corn farmers are proud to invest in third-party research leading to a more sustainable future for our local communities. Minnesota Farmers Union, standing for agriculture, working for farmers. On the web at MFU.org.